this, Jim. Um, I, I swear I had nothing to do with it. But, okay. Um, yeah, so thanks very much. It's always a, a, a tough to follow the Grand Canonical Ensemble. I'll do my best here. Um, so I want to tell you about some of the science we're doing down at the South Pole. And um, I, I made a conscious choice not to focus on, you know, what it's like to work down there or the details of the detector because I want to focus on the outstanding science questions. But if you want to hear stories about working down at the South Pole, feel free to ask me questions because I do have quite a few of them. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about high energy um, astrophysics and exploring the high energy universe with, uh, with Ice Cube, uh, a neutrino detector down at the South Pole. And uh, I think I'll begin by orienting you to this, uh, the history of this field of neutrino astronomy. And then I'll tell you about some of the observations uh, that we've been making over the last four or five years of uh, high energy neutrinos and uh, start to get into where they come from. So just in the last year or so, we've started to make some good progress on this question. And then at the very end, I'll say a few words about what, uh, what we have planned for the next steps. So to start, I'm going to start my story about 100 years ago, um, back in 1912. Uh, this gentleman here, Victor Hess, uh, discovered that the Earth is being bombarded continuously by cosmic rays. Uh, so this was just after radioactivity had been discovered. Uh, people discovered that you couldn't actually get away from this stuff, even if you, you know, locked the photographic plate in a sealed room. Uh, slowly it would be exposed by some sort of high energy particles. Hess uh, decided to get away from everything on the Earth by taking this balloon up to five kilometers altitude. Uh, if any of you are mountaineers, um, five kilometers is a long way up there, actually. I don't know how you make uh, scientific observations up there, but he did. And he showed that actually, as you get uh, further and further up into the atmosphere, the radiation gets stronger, not weaker, and therefore the radiation, a lot of it has to be coming from outer space. Uh, so about 20, 25 years later, um, people like Bruno Rossi and Pierre Auger discovered that in fact the cosmic radiation isn't individual particles. So they um, they set out these arrays of, uh, of particle detectors that were separated by very large distances, hundreds of meters, and running in, uh, in coincidence. And they found out that, that the, um, the, the separated counters would go off at the same time at a far higher rate than you uh, would expect from random chance. And that means these, uh, these cosmic rays are coming down in bundles, sort of like in this artist's description here. And uh, Auger did a really clever measurement. He said, how much uh, energy must be lost in the atmosphere? How big is this pool of particles on the ground? And he said that, well, these cosmic ray air showers have to extend up to 10 to the 15 electron volts. Now, even today, that's a lot of energy. That's about 100 times more energy than the LHC can accelerate particles to. And this is back in the 30s. So you know, this was kind of mind-bogglingly uh, high amounts of energy. And you know, the immediate question is, what out there in the universe is producing particles with this high of an energy? And things actually got worse over the next uh, few decades. In 1962, the first air shower above 10 to the 20 electron volts was reported from uh, an experiment at Volcano Ranch. Now, I'm not going to um, necessarily stake my, my reputation on that first claim, but there have been other um, there have been other uh, cosmic ray experiments, and the fact that the cosmic ray spectrum extends up to this energy is pretty well established at this point. So there's this puzzle out there that's been on the table for, for many decades. Uh, what out there in the universe is producing these particles? <coughs> OK, so this is one side of my history book. The other side deals with neutrinos. So you've probably heard the story Wolfgang Pauli. Uh, his famous letter, Dear Radioactive Ladies and Gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> so in 1930, he proposes the existence of an invisible particle uh, in order to explain the spectrum of beta decay uh, elements. And uh, about 23 years later, Fred Reines and, uh, and Glenn Cowan uh, confirm the existence of these particles. So uh, Pauli had originally expected that these things would be almost or essentially impossible to detect. Um, Rhinus and Cowan showed that, well, they're very hard to detect, but if you've got a big enough detector or enough neutrinos coming through, you can actually see a few of them. Okay, so these two uh, lines of scientific history had come together already in 1960, uh, so 58 years ago, 
Uh, and you can find papers by Markov, by Ken Grison, and by Fred Reines. Each of them were proposing uh, the idea of using large neutrino detectors to do astronomy. And back then, you know, if you read the papers, they're kind of apologizing for how ridiculously large these detectors would have to be. There might be several thousand tons. Well, okay, they were off by about a factor of 10 to the 5. <laughs> um, so it's a lot harder than they realized at the time. Um, but the basic idea was there already. And I, I love this, um, this review by Fred Reines because in this one paragraph, he highlights basically the entire field for the next 60 years. So let me just highlight a few things. Um, due to the weak interaction of neutrinos with matter, they'll propagate essentially unchanged in direction and energy from wherever their sources are. So they're an astronomical messenger. And that's good because that means they can reach us from other galaxies, whereas charged cosmic ray primaries, the cosmic rays themselves, are going to be deflected by the galactic magnetic field and also the intergalactic magnetic field. And so you can see the cosmic rays, but you can't point them back into the universe to figure out where they're coming from because they've been bent before they got to us. The photon, our more usual source of astronomical information, can be absorbed by cosmic matter, such as dust. Well, and we also now, actually the worst part, is cosmic radiation. The, the microwave background left over from the Big Bang, infrared radiation left over from uh, early galaxy formation. Uh, these absorb high energy photons. Uh, and so you're left with neutrinos uh, are the only things of high energy which can make it to us unchanged. And then he has this, this line that I, I love. At present, no acceptable theory of the origin and diffusion of cosmic rays exists, so the cosmic neutrino flux cannot be usefully predicted. In other words, this is a totally unexplored area of the universe. We have no idea what's going on. We ought to go and look and figure it out. All right, so this was 1960. Um, let me give you just a, a little bit of uh, a summary of, of basically the way we talk about it today. So we, we assume that there are some astronomical sources, some astrophysical accelerators out there in the universe. Um, what we call this today is multi-messenger astronomy. So we, we talk about uh, neutrinos and gamma rays and cosmic rays as messengers bringing us information from those sources, allowing us to model uh, the dynamics of what's going on in these sources. And these sources, as, we've, as I've said, are incredibly powerful. They're far more powerful than anything we can reproduce here on Earth. So there's very interesting physics going on in these sources. The cosmic rays are going to be deflected by magnetic fields. So you know, if you see one coming here and you say, well, it came from that direction, well, you're just wrong. Okay. Um, Energetic photons are going to uh, be absorbed. They're going to interact and, and scatter with the cosmic microwave background, with the, uh, the infrared background. And so um, if you want an electrically neutral messenger particle that can actually make it to us through the universe, uh, you're stuck with neutrinos. And that's what this plot shows. As a function of the energy of the messenger particle, um, what is the distance that you can see out into the universe? And so this is a log scale. So uh, it gets distant fast. This is the galactic center, the distance to the galactic center. The nearest galaxies, the nearest blazars, these, I'll talk about what those are in a minute, and then the cosmological maximum of star formation. And um, so this is, if you actually sit down and do the calculation of photons interacting and producing electrons and positrons, this is how far roughly the photons can travel in the universe. And so you see this horizon that's kicking in about, at about a TeV in energy. And beyond the TeV, well, maybe you can see parts of the galaxy, but that's about it. If you want to explore the universe with these energies, you're stuck with neutrinos. OK. So we've said that these accelerators are ridiculously powerful. <coughs> and that's actually a really important clue as to what they might be. Because there's not so many things out there in the entire universe that have the sort of energy required to accelerate particles to these, to these energies. Um, so what we normally assume is that there is what we call a Fermi acceleration mechanism going on. So there's a magnetic shock wave, and particles are, are accelerating. They're being scattered back and forth, back and forth. The classical analog would be two uh, walls moving together. If you're a Star Wars fan, you can probably imagine what I'm thinking about. And a ping pong ball bouncing back and forth between them. And if those walls move together, the ping pong ball will pick up more and more energy from the wall. It'll speed up. Similar thing uh, happening out in space, except there's only one wall, um, and it's a magnetic field, which is 
uh, making the particle come back and hit the wall over and over again. And that means you can calculate how uh, high of an energy the particle can, uh, can be accelerated to before it escapes, before the magnetic field isn't strong enough to con contain it anymore. And so if you calculate the Larmor radius, the magnetic bending radius of these particles, you find that it's 30 kilometers divided by the charge of the particle, uh, the momentum comes in in GeV, and the magnetic field strength in Gauss. And so what that means is the product of the magnetic field strength times the scale size of the, of the um, accelerating object gives you your maximum energy. And that's what this plot shows. You have um, the size of the accelerator uh, versus the, uh, the magnetic field strength. And in the entire universe, this is the collection of candidates that have been proposed. Uh, you can see here's the LHC, our most powerful particle accelerator. It's not even close to the, the power that we would need to accelerate these, um, these particles. Um, so this is the line that you would have to reach to accelerate an iron nucleus with a high charge up to 10 to the 20 electron volts, 100 echo electron volts. Uh, if you've got protons going up to that uh, energy, then you need even more. And if you want to get up to 10 to the 21, which is about the highest claims that have been made, you need to reach this line. You can see there's not too many different objects out there. So what are some of these candidates? Um, this is kind of the rogues gallery, the, the mugshot list of the most popular candidates that are out there. So you've got things in our galaxy like supernova remnants and pulsars. Uh, so this is an image of a supernova remnant where the blast wave from the exploding star is sweeping up matter. We see acceleration from this blast wave. That's what you're seeing in this, in this image from a high energy gamma ray telescope. Uh, but we're pretty sure that it can't get up to 10 to the 20 electron volts. 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16, OK, not 10 to the 20. This is a pulsar, uh, a rapidly spinning neutron star with very strong magnetic fields. Uh, we know that these accelerate electrons, but we don't know where we would be getting protons in such a system. So we don't think that these are going to do it either. Um, there are things called gamma ray bursts, and this is actually two different classes of objects. Uh, some of them are extremely large stars which are collapsing and exploding in something that's like a more powerful supernova, called a hypernova. Um, the other objects that we call gamma ray bursts are coalescing neutron stars, like the ones that were seen by LIGO and many um, optical and, and electromagnetic observatories uh, last year. Um, these, uh, for a long time, were very uh, popular candidates uh, because of the energies involved in these very extreme events, uh, but we're actually we're not seeing them, so we're, we're pretty much ruling these out as the sources of the highest energy cosmic rays. There are things like starburst galaxies, where there's so many supernova going off that um, the, the particles can bounce around and be accelerated to very high energies. Um, the thing that I'll be talking about most today are, are objects of this class, active galactic nuclei. So these are supermassive black holes in the center of some galaxy, maybe 10 to the 8 solar masses or so. Uh, they're accreting matter from their host galaxy in a way that is uh, rather complex. And people like Mark and Megan spend a lot of their time trying to understand what's going on in these processes. But we see observationally that in many cases, um, they are e they're ejecting a, a column, a jet of uh, particles, which is being fired out into space. And this jet of relativistic particles is actually um, collimated on scales comparable to the size of a galaxy, tens of kiloparsecs. So these are extremely powerful um, cannons, if you like, firing particles out into space. And if we're looking down the, the, uh, the barrel of that cannon, so that we're looking straight into the jet, the jet is pointed at Earth, that's what we call a blazar. So these are some of the uh, sorts of objects that have been thought about. The sort of generic um, mechanism for the acceleration um, is you're scattering off of some magnetic shock wave, this Fermi acceleration process. And then the neutrinos come in because in that acceleration process, you have these high energy particles floating around. If they, if they interact with um, radiation or with gas in that vicinity, then uh, we know the basic particle physics. You're going to produce um, unstable mesons, things like pions and kaons, which are going to decay. And those will um, eventually produce neutrinos. Uh, so these are the, the Greek symbols for neutrinos. Um, <coughs> there are actually three types of neutrinos. Two of them are produced in these, uh, in these decay 
uh, processes, electron neutrinos, and muon neutrinos. And there's a third type, the tau neutrino, which can appear as these um, neutrinos travel through space through a process called oscillation, flavor oscillation. All right. The thing that you have to worry about is, well, we see all these candidates that I talked about on the last slide out there in the universe, but we see them through electromagnetic emission. We see the, the photons they emit. And the trick with photons is you can produce them this way, but you can also produce them, and it's much more easily produced by just accelerating electrons. So the thing that neutrinos bring you is, number one, you're guaranteed that you'll be able to see deep into the, the energetic regions of the accelerator. And number two, you know that what you're seeing are hadronic processes. You, you know that things like atomic nuclei are being accelerated. OK. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the detection um, method and the, and the detector. The basic idea is this. Neutrinos don't interact very often, but they will very rarely deign to interact with your detector. Um, so you sit there and you, um, you wait until one of the maybe 100,000 neutrinos decides to interact. Can be in your detector or just outside if, if particles come to you. So for the particle physics, uh, we're talking about uh, experts in the audience, we're talking about purely deep and elastic processes at the energies I'm interested in. The, um, some of the particles produced in this interaction will be charged particles. Um, so um, this hadronic shower is going to be a spray of electrons and positrons and mesons and things. And sometimes you'll get muons or electrons if it's a charge current interaction. These charged particles all have so much energy that they're moving faster than the speed of light in ice, which is slower than the speed of light in vacuum. And that means they emit Cherenkov radiation. So this is, uh, mathematically, this is the equivalent of a sonic boom except it's happening in light rather than sound waves. Um, if you're a movie fan and you go to the movies and you see the eerie blue glow from a nuclear reactor, that's not Hollywood. That's real. If you ever get a chance to tour a nuclear reactor, I highly recommend it. It's really, really cool. Um, but this blue glow is uh, ridiculous numbers of high energy particles escaping from the radioactive piles and streaming through the water where they're absorbed. And as they do that, they give off this blue light. So the blue light is the Cherenkov radiation that we're going to detect. OK, so if you're going to um, detect a reasonable number of these neutrinos, then you need a lot of neutrinos or a really big detector. And so we try to get the biggest detector that we can. And that means we need a clear medium so that the Cherenkov light can travel through. And the clear medium that we chose is actually the South Polar Ice Cap. Uh, it turns out that the ice down in Antarctica is incredibly pure and inc incredibly transparent because the planet has basically acted as a distillation process on a continental scale. And so um, it's, it's, there's very low levels of contaminants down in the ice. The National Science Foundation manages a research facility down there, the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. Um, this is a, a, a picture of the station. This is the entire station. It's not you know, a bustling metropolis down there. Uh, you can fly in on, a, on an Air Force cargo aircraft from November to, to February. That's the Austral summer. And what limits that is the temperatures. So as long as it's above minus 50, the plane's hydraulics will not freeze, and everything is good. Below minus 50, things get dicey. So um, they, they stop the flights for about eight months a year. And there's a crew of about 45 winter overs who stay through the entire winter. Uh, and, and run all of the experiments and things down at the station. So this is the living quarters. This is the cargo storage area. Uh, this is the ski way where the planes land. They're actually ski equipped um, cargo aircraft. And over here is what we call dark sector where the astronomy happens. Uh, this building here is the ice cube laboratory. But don't think that Ice Cube is inside the building. This is just where the computers are. This is the footprint of Ice Cube. So it's about a, a square kilometer footprint on the surface. And then the detector itself is buried about a mile below the surface, 1.45 kilometers. OK. So this is what it's like when you're arriving. Um, you, you get off of the cargo aircraft. And there's uh, people there to say, come this way. Don't walk into the backwash of the propellers and so on. Um, so anyway, it's, it's an interesting experience flying in, a, in an Air Force cargo uh, plane. You are not technically considered cargo <laughs> because they don't have to give the cargo a lunch. As far as I can tell, that's the only distinction that they make. But, um, it, it's interesting. 
so here's just a few pictures of what it's like to, to work uh, down at the South Pole. These are the detectors that we bury in the ice, and this is a picture of, of us deploying one of our strings. Um, we actually to install the sensors into the ice, we melt a column down two and a half kilometers deep into the ice cap. This is the first stage of the, of the hot water drill that we use to melt our way down. Uh, and then after deployment, we've got all of these cables that run down to the sensors, and they all come and uh, they, they come up this, uh, this uh, uh, tower here and into our counting house where all of our computers live. So this is a schematic of what the detector looks like. It's a cubic kilometer, about a gigaton, of uh, ice that has been instrumented with these digital optical modules, these DOMs, these basketball-sized uh, photosensors. And it's arranged in a three-dimensional array uh, between 1.45 and 2.45 kilometers down into the ice. So the sensors are spaced uh, vertically by about 17 meters and horizontally, the strings are about 125 meters apart. So this is an incredibly sparse detector. Uh, we have 5,000 channels monitoring a cubic kilometer of the ice. So what do events look like? So if a neutrino produces a muon, and the muon comes screaming through emitting Cherenkov radiation, uh, this is what the Cherenkov photons do. So the muon is here at the, at the head. What you're seeing are the tracks of the simulated photons, and this is um, this is an animation that was made by Professor Copper here in the department. So thanks very much, Claudio, for, uh, for sharing this with me. Um, so the track of the muon is here. The, the little fuzzy things are the Cherenkov photons emitted by the muon. And the, um, the colors indicate how far below or behind the Cherenkov cone the photons are. So initially, things are red. That means the photons have just head straight out into the ice. And then as they bounce around a lot, they get delayed. And so we turn them uh, yellow and green and blue. So that's how you want to see this. Um, of course, this is not what our detector records. This is only a computer model. Uh, and I should say, by the way, that this has been thinned by, I believe, a factor of 1,000. So there's actually 1,000 times more photons generated here than, um, uh, than are shown here. What our detector records is only a tiny fraction of those photons, the ones that happen to hit our detectors. And so this is what our event display looks like that we actually use. What's happened here, the way you want to read this, is a neutrino has come in from the right. It's invisibly passed through the first layers of the detector. It interacted with a nucleon right about here. And then uh, a muon came out and passed through the detector from right to left. Uh, each of these colored circles is one of the optical modules that uh, detected photons. The size of the circle indicates how much light it detected, and the color running from red to blue indicates the time at which the, the uh, photons arrived. So the earliest photons are the red ones, and the latest ones are the green, and so you can see this is uh, a muon moving from right to left. So this is what happens most of the time when muon neutrinos interact. Remember, there are three types of neutrinos. Um, this is a charge current interaction. And we get reasonably good um, angular resolution. Um, please, astronomers, bear with me. Um, it's better than a degree. It's about a half degree to a third of a degree, which in high energy astrophysics is not great, but it's not too bad. Uh, for astronomers, they kind of chuckle and, and you know, behind your back. But OK, it's, it's OK. It's a start. Um, I won't talk about energy resolution too much, except to say that in this case, the muon um, interacted, the neutrino interacted in the detector. But in many cases, the neutrino actually interacts over here. And all you see is the muon entering the detector. And so what you measure is a lower limit on how much energy the neutrino originally had because you don't know if it started 200 meters outside your detector or 10 kilometers outside your detector. OK. The other two types of neutrinos produce what we call cascade events. Um, so the particle itself only scatters around for a few meters or tens of meters. And the Cherenkov photons radiate out in all directions. This looks like a sphere, but notice that the colors are just a little bit asymmetric. So it's not a perfect sphere. And the computer can actually tell the difference. So you get. Um, good energy resolution because you know that the neutrino interacted in your detector and you know you measured all the light all the energy that was deposited um, but the angular resolution is quite poor even by our standards and this is what uh, an event like that would look like in our event display 
Uh, so this is what the other two types of neutrinos usually do. Okay. So um, that's how the detector works, and that's the science we're trying to do. So let me tell you a little bit now about our results, and I'm going to try to highlight as I go along the things that don't make sense yet. So um, that's going to become my theme here. Things don't make sense. All right. Um, so the fundamental problem, what I've, what I've told you all sounds nice and easy. The fundamental problem is separating the neutrinos we're interested in from the background that we're not interested in. So each year, uh, a detector like Ice Cube detects about 10 billion atmospheric muons. So what happens is a cosmic ray hits the atmosphere. There's a bunch of particles produced. Muons just make it through. Um, so if our detector is down here at the South Pole, um, there is a downgoing muon, by which I mean coming from the southern sky. Remember, you're standing at the South Pole here. Um, so there are lots of these. They trigger about 3,000 times per second. The second type of um, of uh, background that you have to worry about are what are called atmospheric neutrinos. So if a cosmic ray hits the atmosphere on the other side of the Earth, it will produce many particles. Some of those particles are actually neutrinos, and the neutrinos will travel straight through the Earth and arrive at your detector. And these are real neutrinos, so in principle they're not, there's nothing fundamental about them that distinguishes them from the astrophysical neutrinos that you're after. And we detect uh, about 100,000 of those every year. Uh, and then the highest energy cosmic neutrinos, we get about one a month. Now there are more, it's just that they're at lower energies where we can't identify them one by one. So the, the ones that are kind of the gold-plated neutrinos, we get about one a month. And so you can see just by looking at the number of zeros here, uh, this is the fundamental challenge of operating a detector like this. Okay. So how do you do that? How do you beat down the background to get to the cosmic neutrinos? Well, there's two strategies that we use. The first is, well, if you just look down through the planet, then you're using the Earth to filter out everything except neutrinos, or at least everything that we know about. Um, and so that gets rid of all of the atmospheric muons, the 10 billion backgrounds. Uh, now, you've still got those 100,000 atmospheric neutrinos, but those are mostly at lower energies, and so if you demand that the neutrino be energetic enough, then uh, you've probably got an astrophysical neutrino. The problem is the energies that you need to get above the atmospheric neutrinos are high enough that you've thrown out most of your astrophysical yeah. neutrinos too, but you can do this. It does work. And this was sort of the classical strategy that everybody since Markov's day had expected to use. The big um, thing that happened uh, this a few years ago was we realized, well, there's another way to do it. Um, the thing about neutrinos is they don't interact, except very, very rarely. And so they will invisibly pass through the outer layers of your detector. And so if you demand an event that starts in the very center of your detector, hundreds of meters away from the edge, the only thing that we know of that can do that is a neutrino. All right. Um, and this is nice because you get all the flavors of neutrinos. For this channel, you mostly get um, muon neutrinos because to have a reasonable event rate, you need to include the ones that happen below your detector. Whereas for this, you get all of the neutrinos with no, no biases, and you can observe the full sky. So you're not restricted to only looking through the planet. You can actually look up into the, into the overhead sky as well. Okay. And that's good, um, but the real trick to this second approach is what was realized a few years uh, ago, which is that, well, you're going to use uh, the outer layer of your detector to veto particles coming in, uh, and so you're going to reject an atmospheric muon because it hits some of the sensors at the edge of the detector, whereas the signature of a neutrino is it starts inside. But if you've got an atmospheric neutrino, this 100,000 background events that we still have to worry about, well, the thing about an atmospheric neutrino is it's produced in our own atmosphere. And it's produced when a high energy cosmic ray hits the atmosphere. And when that happens, you're going to get a spray of all kinds of particles, not just neutrinos. And if you're looking up, then some of those particles are going to have enough energy that they penetrate to your detector, and they're, you're going to see them as an atmospheric muon background. And so the signature in this case is not just a bare neutrino, but it's a neutrino accompanied by a penetrating muon. And if you're vetoing events, then you're going to veto this event too. So th this means that you can actually veto the atmospheric neutrinos, at least for some of the overhead sky. Um, and, and you can actually distinguish directly 
the atmospheric neutrinos from the, the ones produced in distant astrophysical sources. So this was the breakthrough that we made about five years ago now. Um, this, the key signature to this approach is the angular distribution. So this is a plot of how many neutrinos you have as a function of direction, downgoing neutrinos over here, upgoing neutrinos over here. For the atmospheric neutrinos, if it weren't for the veto, then you would have this symmetric distribution like this. It's peaked at the horizon because of some particle of physics effects that I won't talk about. There's a little dip here where things get absorbed in the Earth at high enough energies. But it's basically symmetric. But then this <coughs> atmospheric neutrino veto effect kicks in, and it takes the downgoing neutrinos from this line all the way down here. So it greatly suppresses the downgoing neutrino. Whereas for an astrophysical ne neutrino flux, if it starts out isotropic, it's going to stay isotropic. And so the signature of an atmospheric uh, sorry, of an astrophysical neutrino flux is that it's got a basically flat distribution. And if you look at our data, this is our latest update of, of the data set that we originally published in 2013, that's exactly what the data do. They're flat with a little bit of a suppression for the, um, for the upcoming events because of Earth absorption. And what you expect for the atmospheric background is this very sharp cutoff in the downgoing region, which is clearly in conflict with our data. So this, um, this was the, the breakthrough that allowed us to claim the discovery of, of astrophysical neutrinos and to allow us to start measuring their flux. And this is the energy spectrum that we currently have for this, um, for this analysis. I'll, I'll show this to you again on the next page. I just want to show you that after you correct for all of the detector effects, this is what a flat power law would look like. Um, there's a reasonably good agreement in most of the range, maybe a little bit of an excess at the higher energy. But it's not too bad of a fit, although this, the statistical error bars are very, very large. OK, now the other approach, that, that classical approach of looking for upgoing tracks, that does work too. Uh, the neutrinos you get are mostly just one flavor. And instead of looking primarily at the overhead sky, you're looking primarily at the other side of the universe. Um, but you, you can measure the neutrino flux. And we do, in fact, see a neutrino flux there. The flux that we measure now with 6.7 sigma just in this in the separate channel uh, from the muons, uh, this is the red range here. Uh, that's the flux that we measure from this channel. Now remember I said you don't directly measure the neutrino's energy. You only get a lower limit. And so it's hard to make a differential spectrum here. That's why we've got a, a red shaded region instead of individual points. Um, but this is, this is roughly the spectrum that we measure. Now the crosses here are the same crosses that were on the previous slide. Well, it's a slightly smaller data set from a, a year or two older, but it's, it's basically the same spectrum. And one thing I want to point out is that um, there's good agreement in the region where both analyses are sensitive. <coughs> but if you tried to extend this muon measurement, the red measurement, to either lower energies or higher energies, it would not match up with the, with the measurements that we make through the starting event analysis. So this is something that we need to work out. We're not quite sure what's going on there. OK. This kind of summarizes it. Um, there's, uh, this is the same stuff that I showed on the, on the last slide. And there's some evidence of structure in the cosmic neutrino spectrum that presumably tells us something about the sources, but we don't know what. So I'm just going to circle this. This is one of the questions that we need to figure out in the next year. There's some other things that I want to point out with respect to the energy spectrum. The first thing is, and this is a little busy plot, I apologize for this, I'll walk you through it. The first thing is, if you start with a neutrino spectrum, uh, so that's the dashed blue line here, and you assume that there are photons produced along with the neutrinos, like the particle physicists tell, tell us should be happening, uh, and then you take that flux of high energy photons and you propagate it through the universe and you let it interact with the cosmic microwave background and all of these processes we expect, then the photons you end up with would follow the solid blue line. And that seems to match very, very well with the isotropic high energy gamma ray background that, that the Fermi satellite, Fermi gamma ray telescope measures. OK, that's actually a problem. I'll come to that in a second. The other thing that you connect, connect it to, you can connect this neutrino flux. Um, so if you start from the cosmic rays, and you say, assume that all of the cosmic rays interact with their sources, 
Uh, what would the neutrinos look like? An ice cube, that would get you this dashed green line here, the, 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 um, the extra galactic cosmic rays, not the foreground that we know are produced in our own galaxy. And that's actually pretty close to the neutrino flux that we see. So in that sense, it's almost a surprisingly high flux. Um, but it does suggest that there is a close connection between all of these, what we're seeing in the universe, and all of these different messages. Okay, um, I'll come back to why this is a problem in just a second. Okay, so we're trying to do astronomy here. The fundamental question that we're trying to answer is where do these neutrinos come from? So the first thing you can do is say, well, I've got my 60 or so, uh, well, I guess it's up to 80 some now, um, gold-plated astrophysical <coughs> neutrinos. A few of them are background, but not too many. Um, where do they come from on the sky? Just the simplest thing you can do, and this is the answer you get, and the answer is everywhere. Okay, so there's no giant source out in the sky, like, um, for example, the moon, if you look up with your own eyes, or, you know, uh, Centaurus A in radio, or something like that. Um, there's no obvious answer here. Well, we do have more neutrinos. They're buried in the atmospheric background, so if you want to improve your sensitivity, you actually allow some background in, and this is the map that you get, but the answer doesn't change. They're coming from everywhere. There's no giant hotspot there. Okay. You can, another thing you can do is you can go back to your list of potential candidate accelerators, and you can say, do I see excesses from the direction where I know that there are <coughs> gamma ray bursts or blazers? All right, gamma ray bursts are the easiest because you not only know where they go off, you also know when, so within a few seconds, you know, kind of scale. And so there's very little background, and the answer is we don't see it. So this is the neutrino flux that uh, we observe in total. <coughs> These are the limits um, that we're placing, uh, and because the limits, the upper limits are below the flux, we know that the gamma ray bursts are not producing the neutrinos that we see. I'm running a little behind, so I won't spend more time on this. Um, the other candidate that people have been really excited about for a long time are these active galactic nuclei, these blazars, where we're looking down the barrel of this relativistic jet of particles. And if you stack up all of the blazars that are detected by the Fermi gamma ray satellite, and you and you say how much of how much of an excess is there that could be associated with that, the answer is zero, and the upper limit to how big that excess could be is one of these numbers, depending on the assumption you make, maybe five, ten percent. Now, I'm not a big fan, actually, of this analysis because I think there's a lot of assumptions that go into it, and some of those assumptions are good and some of them are a little bit weaker. Um, in particular, if only some of those blazars produce neutrinos or if the neutrinos only come out occasionally, uh, the upper limits can be weakened, but they can be weakened by maybe a factor of five, four, something like that, not by a factor of 10. Uh, and so maybe you could get away with 20 or 30 percent of the neutrinos coming from these blazars, but it's going to be tough to figure out how you could get all of the neutrinos from blazars. Okay, well that's a problem, because remember I said that if you take the neutrino spectrum that we see and you predict how many gamma rays there should be, everything looks great. Uh, so th this is something that a number of people have looked at. Um, the argument that I like best is by Bechtel et al. Um, and this is, these are the plots from their paper. So you take the <coughs> spectrum that we measure with ice cube, you make a fit to it, and you assume that basically right outside of ice cube sensitivity range, you make the flux go down as, as hard as you think you plausibly could. So there's a high energy cutoff just beyond ice cube's range of sensitivity. And below that, the spectrum doesn't continue going up. It flattens out for no good reason. It just does. So this is an attempt to make the lowest um, neutrino flux that you plausibly could. And what you do then is you say, all right, based on this neutrino flux, how many um, photons should there be? And that's what these solid lines are. And you compare it to the isotropic gamma ray background from Fermi, which is these blue crosses, and everything lines up almost perfectly, almost too well. And so you say, great. But then the Fermi people come to you and they say, well, actually, um, only about 10% um, of this could be coming from anything other than blazars. So blazars produce the, the dominant part of the, the background that Fermi sees. So if you take the non-blazar part, as Fermi estimates, because remember, the neutrinos we, we decided didn't come from blazars. 
So you take the, the non-blazar part, that takes the, the Fermi lines all the way down here, and then you go in the other direction, you try to predict what the neutrino flux should be, and well, that's not looking so good. You've got an order of magnitude error here, um, and so we're not quite sure. So this is the second big question uh, that, I, that I think we need to figure out, because this, this seems like it makes sense at first glance, but something is wrong. Okay, so one possibility is the blazars do produce the high energy neutrinos despite the weak correlation with the blazars we know from gamma rays. Another possibility is that most of the neutrino sources are something new, but it has to be something that doesn't produce many gamma rays, so maybe it's something opaque. Now, there weren't any opaque objects on the list of candidates out there, so this would be really interesting. This would be something that nobody's looking for. And many of the other types of candidates, the starburst galaxies and things, should not be opaque. So this would disfavor them. Um, now, there is some model dependence here. There's a lot of um, theory that goes into this, but I think most of the theorists who have looked at this believe that this is probably a robust um, tension. Something has to be wrong in this analysis. We don't know why. Okay, so that's where things would have stopped up until about a year ago. And then on September 22nd, 2017, uh, we saw this event. So, you, you know, you guys are experts now. You can tell this is a high energy muon coming from right to left through the detector. Uh, and this was high enough that there was a decent chance that it was probably astrophysical. And so what we did is we sent out uh, what's called a GCN circular to, to our astronomy colleagues. And we said, well, we saw a high energy neutrino candidate. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a reasonably good chance that it could be astrophysical. And so our astronomers um, started looking, and they said, well, actually, there's some interesting stuff going on there. So this is a selection of the first few of the astronomers' telegrams that were sent out. Um, there was, this event was actually followed up by a very broad range of uh, instruments and all sorts of electromagnetic bands, from radio all the way up to gamma rays, everything in between. Uh, including some of our neutrino, other neutrino telescopes. The most interesting things, I think, uh, the first sort of thing that got people excited was the Fermi telescope reported that this um, neutrino, so this, uh, these circles, these ellipses, are the error circles of where we think the neutrino came from, so the 50% 90% containment. Um, and there's a known Fermi gamma ray source there, uh, a blazar. Uh, which goes by the um, easily remembered name of Texas 0506. Um, you know, everything needs a name, whatever. Um, so they said this is a known gamma ray source, and it's actually, it's been more active recently. So blazars, they get active, then they get lazy for a while, and then they flare up again. Uh, it was actually in a high state. And then several days later, the MAGIC telescope, which is a very high energy gamma ray telescope, it observes higher energy gamma rays than Fermi does, it's based on the Canary Islands, it's a ground-based telescope, it said actually not only is Texas a known Fermi source, there's several thousand of those, it's actually producing very high energy gamma rays. And there's only a few dozen uh, of those uh, known in the universe. So this was very interesting. Everybody got excited. All of those, um, all of those observatories followed up. When the dust settled, uh, we, we realized that this is a blazar. There had never been a redshift known for this before. Um, but people actually dug a redshift out. Um, so for the astronomers, it's, it's 0.3365. Uh, it's about a gigaparsec from Earth, so it's a medium distant blazar. Um, but people had assumed, based on the gamma ray luminosity, that it was probably more nearby. So when you put it out at a gigaparsec, um, the, the average luminosity is actually quite high. So it's one of the more powerful blazars in the nearby universe. It's an order of magnitude greater than some of these more famous ones that the experts in the audience probably recognize by name. And again, it was undergoing a major outburst. Well, this was interesting, um, but the, the significance was right about three sigma, which is that sort of unpleasant middle ground between this is really interesting, but it's not ironclad. And then we went back and we looked in the old ice cube data and we discovered that in fact there had been a previous episode. So this is that event from, um, from 2017. This here, this much bigger event, is an outburst that, we had, that had been just below our threshold for detection uh, back in 2014 and 2015. And so there's a second three and a half sigma um, behind this, this single event. 
And so at that point, we get pretty confident. It's not quite five sigma, but it's very close. We're pretty confident that this is uh, a neutrino source. And this earlier flare was much, much brighter. Um, 13 uh, neutrinos as compared to the, the one that we detected in 2017. Um, but there was no single neutrino that generated an alert. None of them were high enough energy to generate a real-time alert. There was not a whole lot going on in GEV gamma rays at the time, but there were indications that maybe something could have been going on at slightly higher energies than what Fermi is sensitive to. And so if we had generated an alert, then the very high energy telescopes might have seen something, but we didn't, so we just don't know what was going. So it was a missed opportunity. Okay. So the modelers have been having fun with this for the last year. Um, there are probably more models on the, on the market at this point. This is just a selection of the, the first few. Um, there are all kinds of different models going on. There are these collimated jets coming out. There are um, dense fireballs. There are, it's all over the map. Nobody really knows for sure what's happening. The, the basic conclusion that I think is robust is the simple models don't work. Okay, so it's not the case that all of the gamma rays are just coming from a bunch of decaying meson. Okay, um, they also can't explain the very different behavior between the two flaring episodes where there was one neutrino and a lot of gamma rays, lots of neutrinos and not many gamma rays. So there's something complicated going on. Um, the electromagnetic mechanisms, so probably accelerated electrons, are producing the bulk of what Fermi saw, except maybe for a little shoulder going on at high energy. So this is the, the spectral energy distribution, the spectrum of the energies that um, were being put out in the 2017 flare. And the thought is that maybe this is a little bit of a shoulder here, and that shoulder might be a hint of some hadronic activity. But everything else that was being emitted is probably leptonic. Because if this was all hadronic, then the x-ray flux that you see here should have been at least 10 times higher. Uh, so when we get in there with the multi-messenger observations, combining the x-ray data, the gamma ray data, and the optical data, um, you cannot fit this with a simple hadronic model. And that's basically where things stand. There's one more thing that I want to point out, um, because I think the theorists haven't actually gotten to grips with this yet. Um, so this is a light curve. This is how much um, how many photons were coming out on any given day. Um, this is the historical observation, and you can see the, the turn up, the, the recent activity here. Uh, this top curve is the very high energy gamma rays, and then the Fermi high energy gamma rays, and then the X-rays here. Uh, and what you see, this dashed line is actually the neutrino. The very high energy activity was 10 days later. It wasn't actually simultaneous. It happened later. And in fact, there are observations in the intervening time that put upper limits which are lower than the VHE activity that was seen 10 days later. So somehow the VHE activity was coming in late. The high energy gamma rays were coming in early. We were on the downside. The, the flare had peaked uh, a couple of days earlier. And then the x-rays seemed to be lined up with the very high energy gamma rays. And as far as I know, no, none of the, the modelers have really come to grips with what this might mean. So this is another sort of open question here. OK. So in the couple of minutes that I've got left, let me say a few words about what's next. I, we've got exciting detections here. But there's some open questions. So first off, how do we interpret the energy spectrum, uh, the muons versus the cascades? They don't seem consistent, or maybe there's some structure in the spectrum. We need to know what's going on there. We don't understand the source that we've seen, Texas 506. Uh, we need to understand what's happening. How are the particles being accelerated? Are they being accelerated to 10 to the 20 electron volts? We are pretty confident they're being accelerated to 10 to the 15 or 16. That's still four orders of magnitude short. So that's an open question. And then this energy balance argument, are the blazars producing the bulk of the neutrinos we see? Or is this just the tip of the iceberg and there's some larger class or multiple classes of neutrino sources that are out there waiting to be discovered? Okay. So how are we going to go about this? Well, um, now that we're astronomers, we're real neutrino astronomers with source, well, maybe not sources, but a source at least. That's a start. Um, now that we're astronomers, we can start asking for bigger telescopes. So that's what we're going to do. So this is our one cubic kilometer uh, ice cube detector. What we would like to do is build ice cube gen 2. This would be 
uh, a, a major facility that would be doing both uh, neutrino astrophysics, all sorts of multi-messenger astrophysics, it would increase the volume of ice cube by a factor of eight to 10 at a, at a cost comparable to the original ice cube investment. So we can optimize the sensor design, we can optimize the sensor spacing now that we have a better idea what we're looking for. It's still a big investment, but it's a lot less than you know eight to 10 times more expensive. Uh, there's various other things that we're looking into. Um, we actually submitted a proposal this week, led by MSU here, uh, to, to develop a preliminary project execution plan. So things are starting to move here. And if, if all goes well, we hope that we may be um, in construction by the middle of the next decade. So that would be very exciting. That would really allow us to get at uh, these questions. In the meantime, uh, we have what's called the Ice Cube Phase One upgrade. Uh, so this is a smaller scale augmentation, and rather than making the detector bigger, it's designed to make the detector better. So it would, um, it would basically improve the focus, if you want to use the analogy, of the ice cube detector by calibrating the ice and calibrating the detector response uh, to much higher precision. So if you look at, for example, the angular resolution as a function of energy, any basic uh, theoretical calculation says as you go to higher energy, your angular resolution should get better. What we actually see is that it doesn't because the, um, the response to the detector is not well enough modeled and our angular errors actually get too big. So there's about a factor of six improvement in angular resolution that we could get from a, um, a perfect calibration of the detector. And of course, the detector isn't changing, it's just our knowledge. So if we can improve it, we can go back to the beginning of the data set, reanalyze everything, and we've instantly got 10 years of improved data to analyze. So um, there's a very rich neutrino program that I won't go into, um, but this is the first step, and this is actually underway. We officially started construction on this project on October 1st. And so if you see me walking around the halls muttering under my breath, it's because I'm deep involved in uh, this, uh, this construction project. Okay, so that I think is where I'm going to end. I will say, you know, we've discovered a flux. We are opening a new window on the universe. Uh, the high energy neutrinos, in some sense, are a surprisingly high flux level. Um, the, the energy density is similar to what we see in cosmic rays and in gamma rays. It's a very high flux. There's a lot of energy out there in the universe associated with these neutrinos. The strong evidence for two episodes of emission from this first source that we've identified, Texas 0506, but the dynamics are not simple and we, we need to figure out what's going on. Um, there's also, there's good reason to believe that blazers are not the only sources of the cosmic rays, so we need to understand that. And there is a global program underway uh, to, to build new things, so that um, is an exciting time. I hope this is, um, this is a plot I'll leave you with. Uh, this is a plot of the number of sources known from different types of telescopes from the earliest days, so the first X-ray um, object in the universe, the first gamma ray emitting object, the first VHE gamma ray um, from the earliest telescopes. And you can see in each of these cases, um, after the early days, things have skyrocketed. So now we, now we know where the start point is for neutrinos, and hopefully we'll be following the same path as well. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>